I'm Terry David Mulligan. I can't remember the last time in the 27, 28 years I've been doing The Stew where I've spent the better part of an hour just talking about, thinking about, and playing a certain artist. But Ross Kunkel has been in the chair for many, many, many years as a, the drummer, the guy. So the band, of course, is the immediate family. They've backed up James Taylor, Keith Richards, Jackson Brown, Linda Ronstadt, Carol King, Stevie Nicks, Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young. They are Danny Korchmar, Wadi Wachtel on guitars, the drummer is Russ Kunkel, and the bassist is Leland Scalar, who's been on this show previously. And they have a the, the new kid, who's not a kid and has been around a long time, guitarist Steve Postel, who also brings vocals to this group, which helps a lot. They are a legitimate supergroup. They are the immediate family. You can find the documentary if you just go searching for it. It's about some of the life that they have lived. In many cases, there weren't cameras running when they were recording with Jackson Brown and Linda, James Taylor, Keith Richards. They have a new album coming out uh, February the 16th. It's called Skin in the Game. It's damn good. The Immediate Family is a unique group of iconic musicians, and four of them are simply the most respected and sought-after players in modern music. Danny Korchmar, guitar and vocals, Wadi Wachtel on guitar and vocals, Leland Scalar on bass, and Russ Kunkel on drums. Not only will you hear them in studio, Leland Scalar and R Russ Kunkel uh, go out on the road with uh, Lyle Lovett. I can't possibly play or mention all of the artists that Russ Kunkel has played with and that the band has played with. I'll do the best I can on the website, mulliganstew.ca. But do your own digging around. Google Russ Kunkel and try to follow the list. It's phenomenal. There's a lot of music in this. And speaking of music, because Skin in the Game does not get released until February the 16th, I'm going to play you 90 seconds of the title track and the first single released, The Male Brothers' Toughest Girl in Town. Here's the man behind the stories. I'd like to welcome to Mulligan Stew and CKUA, Russ Kunkel. He literally has played the music of our lives. And at the same time, he had the best seat in the house. Hey, Terry. I'm astonished that we've never met. Astonished. It's crazy. It's crazy because you look so familiar to me. How is that possible? Oh, wait a minute. I have no idea. I have no idea. Have you spent time? Former in life, life, maybe. <laughs> time in Canada? I have. That's, yeah. Of course. Yeah. You, you, you married a Canadian, did you not? I did. I did. Well done. Yes. I'm one of the few people that realize that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm thrilled, and I know I'm not going to get this in, in in 40 minutes. I'm going to do the best I can, all right? Absolutely. Well, a, first of all, I just want to say it's a real honor that you wanted to do this interview with me. I, I really appreciate it. I did, because you you and I have been traveling opposite sides of the road, but going, going in the same direction. Right then, uh, we have so much to talk about, simply because uh, there's a new album, Immediate Family album. They don't come along that often. Um uh, there's a documentary that I spent I spent the summer as a Critics' Choice member looking at um, 350 documentaries, and I started with you. It was the first title I picked out. I went, that's, I'm going to start right there. And, wow. And so I, I have seen your documentary. I've been living with it for about a year now. And um, I, I, I kind of know the edges of it, and I, I, I very much appreciate the, the film and now it's currently being screened so that we can talk about it maybe right off the top before the album um <clears throat> the the uh, Danny Tedesco um he knew the story he wanted cuz he he understood studio his father was the was part of the wrecking crew and so there was no hiding from him it was was it was it invasive or did you welcome those cameras in um, it it wasn't invasive at all and everyone did welcome the cameras in. We also did the majority of any of the filming during COVID. So it had an extra layer of, uh, I don't know, kind of carefulness about it. Uh, Denny and his and a very small crew went to each one of our homes to do our individual interviews. And then I think we had yeah. two separate locations. We did the round table at a and Studio A, and we did uh, some recording in a and Studio B. So uh, there wasn't that much, you know, and it wasn't invasive at all. And 
you know, Denny's just like one of us. I mean, he's like a, you know, he's like a six member of the band, really. So. It's rarefied. You, you, I mean, I know it's your life, but it is rarefied air that you're sort of breathing in the space in that it's every day something else is asked of you and you come through. You you set your own high water mark and you, you get to it. You on the drum kit, I believe, this is just a theory of mine, that you ha- you are, are like the catcher in a baseball game. You see everything in front of you. You see the entire game in front of you. You see the reactions. You watch people play. Do you still do you still feel that way? Have you ever felt that way? I've never heard anyone put it like that, but you're spot on. Hmm. You're absolutely right. I I can totally relate to that. Yeah. I know you can't give hand signals. What else can you do? Are you great with eyebrows? <laughs> <laughs> or or maybe you play a little a little bit extra loud ah. <laughs> every once in a while. <laughs> The, I, I, I think uh, somewhere in the documentary, I, I think I say this, and it's really true. Uh, the immediate family band is the hardest group of people to get away with a mistake. Oh, yeah. And I mean, you can't. It's just, it's it's noticed immediately. And yes, there are lots of eyebrows. So <laughs> are they forgiving? Oh, totally. Yeah. It's more, it's funnier than anything. Is there a key to, uh, these are basic big questions. Um, is there a key to how this group stayed together when others fell apart, we simply couldn't get along, they hated each other, couldn't stand each other, went on stage and played and then would never talk to each other? How did, what was the key? Mutual respect, maybe? Well, I think there's a lot of that, Terry. There's definitely mutual respect. But, you know, our, our story and our path is a little bit a little bit different than most because uh, we've ended up as a band, but we, you know, along the way we played in different little configurations, you know. Sometimes Wadi would be a part of what Danny and Leland and I were doing, and sometimes Leland and I would be the only ones. And, you know, at different times we all went off and did different things. So we weren't kind of it's it, we weren't kind of put in a cocoon and had to survive together for 50 years in other words we we survived by playing with each other in different configurations and coming and going so and we ended up in a band so it's kind of like a reverse osmosis in a way uh going back just for a second to Danny Tedesco and actually the whole wrecking crew we found out about them uh late i knew about them because i read my liner notes right they they're gone now because of mp3s and everything else but I followed the, all of their paths. I, who are these people? And then I started to see Leon Russell and Dr. John come out as their own people. And it's, it's astonishing. Um, but you guys had um, a profile because somebody made made the decision to make sure your names were front and center on those albums. So through all the 70s and 80s, we followed you as well as the artist. Right, that's what, and, and uh, Phil Collins mentions that in the documentary that he would he would look on the album covers to see who was playing and follow them. You know, uh, <clears throat> when Elton John was making his first records with Gus Dudgeon, that's when we were making our albums with James Taylor and Carole King. And there was, I got to be kind of close friends with Gus and and went to the UK and recorded some projects with him that he produced, and uh, and. The same thing was kind of happen, happening in London that was happening in California. It was with, you know, Elton's band and the musicians that played around that time. And we were kind of doing the same things, at different, you know, on different continents. And uh, uh, it, was, it was a magical time. It really, really was. Was Jimmy, pa- Jimmy Page and, uh, and, um, and others like him of that era, were, they were doing session work? Absolutely. Jeff Beck? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I good. think so as well. Yeah, for sure. Let me jump here. Skin in the Game is the new album. I've always heard the term in terms of uh, actually cards uh, around a table, speaking around a table, but also it's about um, personal investment. It's, it's about uh, risk, actually. You're, you got skin in the game. You're, you're at risk now. Did you feel at risk? Uh, it's hard to be documented. It, it's hard to come to a point in your life where you where you realize and you have to be okay with the fact that someone thinks that what you've done in your life is important enough to document, you know. So yeah, there's risk, 
And I think I think what Skin in the Game and and Danny and Wadi and I wrote that song. I think what we were trying to what we we're trying to uh, put forth is that if you want to do something that's different and unique and that has meaning, you have to take some risks. You know, you have to kind of walk out on stage naked and play your song and hope that everyone likes it. You know, so. you are looking after your your reputation, your hard earned reputation. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I know that, that you didn't write co-write all the songs, but that's the one that I dropped in. I, I like I like that "Skin in the Game" is one of your tunes. I mean, yeah. what, what is it that sets a tune in motion for you? If uh, because you're watching all these tunes go by, what do you need to hear? What do you need to feel in order to get in there? Well, the, that song started. I I had I came up with the idea to write a song called "Skin in the Game," and and. Danny and I have written lots of songs together over the years. And when I said, when I gave him that, I said, okay, let's write a song called Skin in the Game. He said, yes. And then he, then we started. And then some of the lyrics started to come together. And, and then we brought Wadi in. And it just kind of all, it kind of all, you know, kind of, a, it just came together. You know, we, it doesn't take us long to write songs because we definitely know what we don't like. <laughs> so all the, all the, the chaff gets spit out pretty quickly. been on this show before god bless him um so leland and yourself uh danny and wadi uh tell us about the new kid who's only been around what 20 25 years steve postel is uh has been around uh in the music scene in los angeles for quite some time uh he's he, he's worked with leonard cohen i believe i think he's, he's done some extensive work with david crosby as have i and he has a, a an organization called Night Train Music Club, which he's had for years, which is he just brings together a bunch of different musicians nice. who's ever available and calls in some kind of A-list artists to sing some songs. And he puts out he puts out shows and he's been quite successful at doing it. And he he became part of the band because when Danny uh, moved back out to California, he and Steve kind of hit it off. And uh, sp we're spending a lot of time together, and they, you know, uh, we're writing some songs and doing some. And, and Steve kind of pulled Danny into the LA music scene that he had left when he went to the nice. East Coast for years. Nice. And then when he came back, Steve kind of pulled him back into it. And it was just, it was kind of a natural progression to have Steve be, uh, you know, the fifth member of the band. Plus, Danny and Wadi kind of wanted it to be a guitar band, you know, like the Buffalo Springfield it's as a guitar, opposed to it's a, a guitar keyboard band. band so. It is absolutely yeah, a guitar sure. band. But he also brought vocals. He's an excellent singer and that's that's one of the things we need the one of the areas that we could have used so a little help in. So yeah. yeah. You're being kind. Uh well you're surrounded by great vocalists. <laughs> that's the problem. Every day you're working with great vocalists and so you kinda wanna there's a mark you want to hit there. A whole lot of rock and roll. Uh, is the first single? No, that's no, that's not true. It's the Mail Brothers song, right? "Toughest Girl in Town." Toughest Girl in Town. I remember the original. I kind of wondered what you were going to do with it. How did that come about? A cover to as the first single. 
<clears throat> that was all Wadi. Wadi uh, took a deep dive into the Sparks catalog wow. and uh, and and came up with Sparks all over him. He was glowing, and so he uh, when he heard that song, he thought that that would be uh, an easy fit for us, you know. And uh, I, I quite like the song a lot, and I, I'm very happy with the way that it came out. Um, Ross Kunkel has joined me here. Uh, there's not a kid in sight. He is, in fact. Uh... We're talking about a number of things. First of all, the uh, immediate family documentary you should see. God, so see it and turn it up or wear headphones uh, and apologize to your neighbors. And the other thing you should do is check out Skin in the Game. Their new album comes out February the 16th. Too many irons. I see Stan Lynch got involved there with um, with Danny. Um, and, and the guitar <coughs> lick in it drove me crazy. Could I? Because all of a sudden, and then it came to me. Love is strange. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Took a while. Yeah, we were still from the best. <laughs> <laughs> and don't apologize along the way. Absolutely uh, not. How how's the reaction been to the documentary? Because you've been involved in some of the press of it. What's what's the feedback on it? Terry, I have to say it has been incredible. Uh, the week it came out the week of uh, December twelfth, I think it was the. Uh, the fifteenth, it was available for for, for streaming, but sure. I think the twelfth was uh, the date that the, it, it there was two hundred theaters around the United States that it it came on uh, on the twelfth of December, and the, the the at the end of that week, we got a press release uh, from uh, from our press people that said it was number one on iTunes and number five on Apple TV. I don't know if it still is, but it, that's pretty impressive. So there was a there was definitely a demand for it, and people people are downloading it, and people are buying it. So that's a good thing. Do you, Russ? Do you think about the the at, at times? Do you think about the fans who've come along for the ride, who signed up in 1970 and been with you ever since? Uh, all the time. All the, those are the people that this movie means the most to. You know, they they and the comment that's prevalent more than anything else is this music was the story of my life. Yeah. You know, that's what people say that people that I meet at Q and A's after screenings and stuff, they say, this is, this music changed my life. This is, I grew up listening to all this music. You know? There's so many memories attached to it. Yeah. And, and frankly, when people die, friends die, this is what you think of. It's true. The tunes you shared. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, by the way, the difference between, for the uh, fans out there, audience, the difference between the Wrecking Crew and the immediate family is the immediate family, in many cases, went out on the road with those songs. They, talking about skin in the game, they created the tunes in the studio, helped to arrange those tunes, and then went out in behind the artists we're about to talk about that's that's kind of the difference there, I think. Absolutely, you know, you know what, what James says is the beginning of the documentary. The first time that I saw that, that he had that to say, uh, really touched me. You know, I think he said something like, you know, the importance that that these guys played in my music cannot be overstated. And, uh, and that just to know that he felt that way and he was willing to be, you know, to go on record as saying it was really, pro really profound.
Is Raskunkel. Some some of you only see the top of his head because he's playing behind a kit, but this is what he looks like in real life. Well, sort of real life. I could not pass this opportunity, Russell, but to... This is your life, volume one and volume two. Um, <laughs> but it's such an interesting passage because I had stopped being a Mountie to be a disc jockey based on the music that I was hearing out of my speakers. My father didn't talk to me for a couple of years because he was so disappointed. But I kind of felt I was on the right path, the right path that I wanted to do, that my heart and head told me to do. Maybe you did as well. Because 1970, it all started with the Sweet Baby James. Let's put it that way, with uh, James Taylor in 1970. Mm -hmm. Um, He'd been been in the spotlight, of course, with uh, this Apple signing. And he had had a, a career to save and resurrect. What do you remember about those sessions? Have you come away just a, a thumbnail sketch of what those sessions were like for you? Oh, a little bit surreal. Um, it it was my uh, my initial meeting with Peter Asher. You know, Peter Asher. I was working with a man named John Stewart, and yeah. Peter came to one of our rehearsals and hired me to play on the Sweet Baby James album. And we we rehearsed the songs in Peter's empty living room that he a house that he rented in Los Angeles in 1970. And we went into the studio. We rehearsed the songs in the daytime, and we went into the studio at night into uh, the uh, um, Sunset Sound and recorded the recorded the album. And uh, I don't. It was it was magical. I mean, I mean, it was it was it was history. And looking back on it now, it, it's like I, I wish that someone would have filmed every moment of us recording that to actually have it to look at. But yeah, if we, if I have we, nothing but fond memories about it. But, so. but it's, um, and, and that is uh, true. It's, it's like things go by so quickly, you kind of wonder what stays with you, how the mind works, the things that you remember. But, but it's true. And that's a question. Do you know when a hit is sitting right in your lap? I knew that James Taylor was different than anyone I had ever heard before. Yeah. And I had, I, I think that I had some simpatico to work with James because of my time working with John Stewart. And I, I'll just take a moment here to say, I think John Stewart was probably the very first Americana artist. I think he was doing that and he doesn't get credit for it. Yeah. He was a great storyteller. And uh, and I I learned a lot about how to play the song, and not just a beat. W- working with John Stewart, and I brought a lot of that to the to the James Taylor Sweet Baby James album. So um, I don't think I've ever said that before, but I really believe that that's true. And so 
Um, James was different. James was different than John. I, no one, I had never heard anybody play an acoustic guitar quite the way that he did, how he totally accompanied himself playing bass lines with his thumbs and playing melodies with his other fingers. And, and he was unique. I knew he was different. Did I know <clears throat> that fire and rain was going to be a song that I was going to hear over and over again in every, you know, every drugstore that I go into for the rest of my life? No, I didn't know that. But I knew that he was special as, as the same way I knew that Carol King was special, same way that I knew that Joni Mitchell was special, that they were, they were different. They were cut from a different cloth than other things that I had heard. Did you know Bob Dylan was special? Absolutely. Did all you got to do is just be in a room that he walks into and watch all the pictures tilt. Then you know he's special. <laughs> One of my all-time, all-time, uh, uh, everybody has uplifting tracks that they want to hear that gets them going. Mine is Watching the River Flow. Mm -hmm. That's a great song. That's your lick. I guess so. <laughs> it's been covered hundreds of times, but I love that original lick. Yeah. And he's still going. Absolutely. He's yeah. still going. Uh, Joni Mitchell we love Joni of course Canadian Neil Young Canadian the band I, Canadian my goodness uh, Jackson Brown a great relationship you've had with Jackson Brown over the years did you know him before you went into the studio or was it all self-discovery when you got in there uh, no I, I knew of Jackson before we uh, went in the studio to record uh, I had there was a, a period of time where um, my first wife Leah and I were living um, at her sister's house. Her sister was Cass Elliott. And we were living in a, in a garage apartment, uh, a, a apartment above the garage in her house in Laurel Canyon. And uh, everybody that you could think of would come by Cass's house. I mean, there could be an afternoon where it would be Joni and David Crosby and Eric Clapton and John Sebastian and, and Graham Nash would show up and, you know, then Stephen Stills would show up and on any given day, there could be, you know, five or six different icons just show up to play music and smoke a joint and hang out, you know. So I uh, there was a, a really talented man around that same time named Ned Doheny, who was a singer-songwriter who briefly I was in a band. I was going to be in a band with Ned. It was, it was uh, uh, going to be Cass, Dave Mason, and Ned Doheny. And Ned pulled out of it that it became the Mason Elliott Band, and it was – Brian Groffalo on bass. I played drums and and who's the keyboard player? Oh, Paul. Oh gosh, forgetting his forgetting his name right now. But but uh, I met Jackson during that time because Jackson and Ned were friends. There was a lot of young guys in the area, you know, writing songs. And I, I met Jackson during that time. And then uh, you know we just we would see each other in passing and. When it came time to uh, record that first album, I was fortunate enough to get the call to re record on the on Jackson's. You must Jackson's have put, album. You must have put your heads down at night thinking, "I'm a lucky guy." I I, I still do <laughs> every single every single night. Nothing but gratitude. Seventy seven, by the way, live Crosby, Stills, and Nash, no live Crosby Nash, and then Crosby Stills Nash, and then running on empty Jackson. And excitable boy, boy Warren Zevon, who uh, has a a, a, cl a very beautiful place in my heart. That man, <clears throat> yes, as a man, as as a musician, as an influence. Well, uh, you know, Warren was a lot of different things. Yeah, but to me, to me, and and the time that I got to spend with him, which was always in the studio. He, he was just always trying to get the best out of his songs, you know, just to make it be unique. And uh, my, my memories of him is sitting, sitting behind the piano, just working out parts, wanting to just play it exactly the right way and, and, be, and, and, and nothing but concern, you know, to, to make the music as, as good as it, could, as it could be. You know, being part of the tracks would mean that I was there while we were cutting the tracks and then we would go away. Yeah. But, you know, Waddy and Jackson and Warren would stay and work on stuff. 
for God knows how long. That part of it I wasn't privy to. So, at the same time you're doing all of this, you were you were out going out on the road. Or yes. Yep. One of the things that worked so well in our favor is that, especially you know, working with Peter Asher and, and people like Peter and Lou Adler, is that they would book tours so that we could all be a part of it. In other words, we would be on tour with James Taylor, and if and if we were going to go out with, with Linda Ronstadt, Peter would book the tour so they never overlapped. So whoever needed to be in Linda's band could be and be in James's band. And then Jackson would call Peter and go, well, when are they going to be available? And then I'll book my tour then. So we, I mean, no one would ever do that now. But we, we you know, benefited from that. Or, yeah. or, or Lou would call and just say, okay, well, when can I get the guys? I want to, Carol wants to go out on the road or we want to record with yeah. Carol. And so we got, we got to be, we got the privilege of, of, you know, of them wanting to have us, you know, be a part of the, be a part of their music. Did you see Linda's documentary? I did. It was wonderful. You know, if, you know, one of the, one of the things that uh, you just reminded me of something that Denny talks about is that, when he uh, when he decided to make this documentary, usually one of the big hurdles to get over is availability of principles. Yeah, and uh, that didn't happen on this one. Every he he had an interview with Carol King before he even had any money to do the documentary. So he actually had he actually had to borrow money to 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 go shoot that, <laughs> which he, which I love telling that story. You know, so uh, everyone, every every single person that's that's in the documentary said absolutely yes, and there was no, you know, no problem getting them to be a part of it. James, Ta- it was on the poster. James Taylor, you got the poster? Have you got the yes? Uh, yeah, we got James Taylor, uh, David Crosby, Linda Ronstadt, Don Henley, Warren Zevon, Lyle Levitt. You're still on the road with Lyle? Oh, absolutely, yeah. How, how much every fun summer? Is, excuse me. How much fun is yeah. that? He's, he's amazing. Talk about somebody that's still going, you know, and his, uh, his music covers so many areas. I love being in his band. It's great. He told me in an interview once that um, he needed to f- figure out how to write songs. So when he was going to a, a university in uh, Texas, he uh, started an interview show on the local radio station and only interviewed songwriters so that he could figure out what they were doing. And then he said, that was my education. That's why I went to university. That's pretty, that's pretty insightful. <laughs> uh, Carol King, uh, Keith Richards, who's doing all right. <clears throat> Jackson, uh, Stevie Nicks, Phil Collins, Steve Jordan, whose life has changed. <laughs> well, there was only one person that could ever sit in that seat other than Charlie Watts, and it's Steve Jordan. Yeah. Enough said. Enough said. Because bands literally yeah. fall apart, as you know. Bands fall apart. They can't continue when they lose their drummer. Why is that? Well, it's particularly true with Charlie Watts because, you know, Charlie's Charlie's style of playing and, and what he brought to that chair was the glue that pretty much held the Rolling Stones together. You know, that and, that and his simpatico with Keith and the grooves that they created. Absolutely. I think yeah. it was also his calmness. He's watching, like, yeah. you know, sit, sitting in that chair, like we were talking at the beginning about yeah. about yeah. watching the whole thing, the whole movie in front of you. He's yeah. seeing all of this goof going on. That's right. And he's laughing at them. He's chuckling to himself, right? Uh, and and still laying down that beat. I love that. I love the role he played. <clears throat> By the way, I have to mention something to you. Um there's going to be a documentary that's coming out at some point. I don't know when, but it's, it's being made by a very talented young woman named Erin Feinberg. Okay. And it's called, it's called the best seat in the house. And it's <laughs> exactly what you can imagine. It's about, it's about being a drummer and she's interviewed everybody. And, uh, I, I think Jackson's involved in helping her get this documentary out. So look for it. It's called the best seat in the house. Look, in, look for that. In the time that I have left, Russ Gunkel, 
I'm just going to throw some names at you. Just uh, you can you can pass. You can you can say no comment. You can um, give me a, a thoughts quickly. Keith Moon. Oh man! Wow, gone way too soon. Way too well. You know, I'd lo- I'd love to hear what he'd be doing right now. You know, I mean, have you ever really watched like? a long video of, of, of a of live performance of the way he played with the who I was lucky enough to tour with them on a number of occasions. I, I'll tell you, my, <clears throat> I tell you my key story. I'm at the concert Gebouw in Amsterdam. They've invited me. They're going to do Tommy second time around. <clears throat> concert Gebouw is an egg shaped building with the audience on the back above <clears throat> the stage. They come running down those steps onto the stage, except Keith who's in long red underwear keeps going and falls into the pit and takes the speaker system with him. So they get him out, they get him get him behind his kit, and throughout this entire two and a half hour concert, a roadie would come out with a towel and wipe the blood off of his face that was coming down as he'd cut his head. And he was right, he was covered in blood. It was, and I told this story over and over again, and nobody ever heard it. And now the bootleg, um, the recording of it has come out. You can hear the audience go, oh, as he falls over. Unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, it's hard enough being a drummer. It's hard enough to actually play the part that you have to play for the song, but he would, he would be able to play the part and and none of the who drum parts are easy. And at the same time, he was like a mime. He was able to act and, and direct and do things that were like, it was like acting and playing drums at the same time. And it was the, just incredible to and watch. The beat, was somewhere, the beat was somewhere to be found. The, the band had to figure out that where they were going to meet. Uh, they had to find the crossroads he, again. He knew where it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he knew. He knew. Uh, how about Neil Peart? Oh, man. Another one that's gone way too soon, you know. Did you meet what Hal Blaine? Transfer- did you meet Hal Blaine? I I did meet Hal Blaine and, mm-hmm. and got to spend a, quite a bit of time with him over the years. Yeah, what a joy! Absolute joy. I was so impressed with Al Jackson from Booker T and the Stax Vault. Yeah, I've never saw a guy play the drum with one hand hanging down when he didn't need it. That's right. <laughs> anyway, uh, who have I forgotten? Who who are your the, one, the the drummers that impress you the most actually influence yeah, you. Oh, yeah. you know Terry they're probably the same people that you like you know I you know really influenced by Ringo probably Ringo and Charlie more than anyone yeah uh, you know and and also at the same time by people like Elvin Jones and Louis Belson and Buddy Rich you know on on that side of things but can you how can you not mention Jim Keltner or Jeff Beccaro or Jim or Jim Gordon people don't talk about Jim Gordon anymore because his life was so tragic but that guy was one of the most amazing drummers on the planet you know when he was playing drums he was in his element, you know. His life was tragic beyond that, but he deserves the the credit that he's not getting. So, how about the guy in the chair for Led Zeppelin? <laughs> well, he goes right to the top of the mountain, doesn't he? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, Bonzo is that's one of a kind, right there. Um, you, do you have you have plans to tour with this band? What are you going to do? February. Ah. Yeah, we have uh, we have dates in California. We're doing a, a, a rock legends cruise that's being headlined by Sammy Hagar and the Circle. Billy Gibbons is on the cruise. I hope, look it up. You can look it up on on their yeah. Rock Legends Cruise uh, website. It's going to be fun. That's a week in February, and we have a few dates in, down in South Florida, and then uh, we'll see what happens after that. Did I read somewhere that you're on the new uh, Bob Dylan album whenever it comes out this year? I no, I'm not. Okay. I wish I was. Yeah. Unless unless it's a bootleg of something that was recorded way back when. Okay. So. Uh and anything we can watch for 2024 from you or your group? Well, <clears throat> hopefully we'll be doing uh some more uh touring, you know, as the, as the year goes on, so and I'll be out this summer with Lyle as well. So, so maybe, Leland and I'll be with Lyle. Maybe you'll come to Canada. I sure hope we do. Yeah, I sure hope the immediate family can come back here. You know, the the immediate family played the Vancouver Island Music I, Festival I, I was, I was without there. without me, by the way. Yeah, because I was on tour with Lyle, and they 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 vowed to never do that again. So. <laughs> 
<laughs> but uh, we, we, we would like to come back. So, Have you had fun? Nothing but. Wouldn't like, change a thing. Lucky, luckiest yeah. guy in the world? Absolutely. Like I said, just nothing but gratitude. Thank you for yeah. this. Wonderful. I'm going to have fun with this. Hey, Terry, I really mean this, and I'm, I, I'm serious. This has been an honor for me to sit and talk to you, and I'll do it anytime. Thank you, buddy. And it doesn't even have to be a Zoom. We'll just have lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'll have my people call your people. Thank you so much. God bless you, buddy. Thank you. God bless you. Take care. All right. You are listening to, and I hope enjoying the Mulligan Sioux podcast, mid-January here, 2024, Russ Kunkel and the immediate family. Just an amazing story that's going to be, well, the documentary is out there now. The album comes out, the tour comes out. These guys could st literally stay in the studio and never tour. They've decided to be the band that they always wanted to be. And they're great friends after all these years. And, and, they, and they literally are written to the history of popular music. That's it, right there in a nutshell. Now, second story here. History will be made on Sunday on The CW. Uh, which is carrying the Critics' Choice Awards. And uh, we're going to just do a, literally, I started to call it a cage match. It's four critics sharing a Zoom. And n nothing keeps a critic happier than actually talking about film with other critics. So here we go. If you're ready, Terry Hart uh, in Toronto, Bonnie Lawfer in Toronto, Sean Edwards in Kansas City, and Hilary Atkin in Los Angeles. Here is the Critics' Choice Roundtable. Hello, my friends. Uh, I'm Terry David Mulligan, and this is... Uh, I decided just to come off with the title. I thought I'd call it a Zoomathon, but in fact, it's a cage match. It's a Critics' Choice cage match because, because every time the critics get together, whether it's Zoom or phone or a junket or whatever... That's all we talk about, our film. We talk, well, we talk about other things like football games and things, but um, for the most part, we're talking films here for the next 30 minutes. If you ever wanted to know about the films that you have heard about and, and have not seen or are intrigued by, just know that the Critics' Choice Awards are happening Sunday, and Hillary is going to take us through the nuts and bolts of how that happens. It's on the CW. She's got all those details because Hillary Atkin in Los Angeles is the chair of the marketing uh, division of Critics' Choice. L.A. based, writes for L.A. Magazine, Deadline Hollywood, and many others. Terry Hart is in Toronto, film critic Terry Hart. Hi, Terry Hart. Hi, uh, I love your place, by the way. Um, Bonnie Lawfer, uh, almost from the land of three named people, Sirius uh, XM Radio, and uh, the um, CH Morning Live. She is a, a film critic, of course. And Sean Edwards in Kansas City's WDAF TV Fox, also on the board of directors of the Critics' Choice. But all of that aside, friends, the <laughs> only things that really happen, that really matter, are the nominations. And there's so many of them. Like, for like, if you just want to get caught up, I know I'm doing all the talking, but I'm going to get out of the way. Um, uh Oppenheimer has 13 bids, nominations, Poor Things, followed by Killers of the Flower, Moon, uh, An Even Dozen. Three films uh, are joining Barbie for the Best Picture lineup of The Holdovers with eight, Maestro with eight, F um, American Fiction with five, Color Purple with five, Past Lives with three, and Salt Burn with three. Now, my first question to all of you was, is starting at the top of the page with Bonnie, um, what kind of year was it in the movie business for you? What do you think? For me, I, I thought it was a great year for movies, to be honest with you. There was a lot to choose from, as you as you just said, TDM, that uh, so many nominations for so many great films. You know, the, the best thing about Critics' Choice is that we get to nominate, you know, 10 pictures for in that category for best picture. Um, and I think we kind of nailed it. I don't think there's anything that we really, really missed. Um, we'll talk a little bit later about our favorite ones, but I, I thought there was a lot of diversity. Um, I thought there, you know, look, you can't ignore the Barbenheimer experience of the year. That was huge. Nobody expected that. I love that there was love for both films and that both, you know, both, um, both sides supported each other went to each other's films, encouraged everybody to get out to the theaters. So I think that was my favorite moment film-wise of 2023. Terry Hart? Yeah, I agree. I mean, Barbenheimer, we actually had a phenomenon this year in Barbie, right? This is a movie that will go down in history as something that we talk about, how it changed the game. And I think what also is to be celebrated this year in terms of theatrical movies is we're back to making original movies. 
Oppenheimer is not from IP. Barbie, I know it's, you know, IP from Mattel, but it was an original story. We've got an original story from Alexander Pitt. Alexander Payne in The Holdovers, and we've got that spectacular Coleman Domingo performance, not only in Rustin, but also The Color Purple. So, I mean, I really think that it was a celebration this year of movies that we haven't seen in a long time, and I would be remiss if I didn't not recognize the absolute originality in Yorgos's Poor Things as well. So I think that audiences, critics, fans of movies were able to go to the movie theater this year and actually say, what am I going to see? What is going to unfold in front of me? And that is the excitement of sitting in those four walls with a bunch of strangers. Thank you, Terry. Uh, by the way, Hillary, uh, that, that was your two opinions, of course, uh, valued opinions from uh, uh, Toronto. You're, uh, you're in the middle of the vortex. You're in Los Angeles. Goodness gracious. Um, is it a different read for you for, for the film year of 2023? No, absolutely. I wanted to point out that despite the strikes, which decimated the industry first with the writer's strike and then the actor strike, it was still an incredibly strong year for film. And I want to springboard off what Terry was saying. The originality of a number of the films is incredible. I'm thinking about Saltburn, Poor Things, American Fiction. Um, they were uh, the holdovers. They were all so creative and showed such a diversity of talent and genre. You know, aside from the Barbenheimer um, situation, which I personally loved, and seeing people get back to the theaters, I think all of us are big advocates of the theatrical experience. So it was absolutely thrilling. Um, but just to see all these other films that we've nominated, I have to say, if I didn't love every single one, I highly enjoyed every single one of them. We have an incredible slate of 10 Best Picture nominees. Okay, a word to my, thank you so much, Hillary. A uh, word to my friend, Sean Edwards. Sean, I know that you are under the gun that everybody's on deadline here today. If you depart, if you leave and all of a sudden we see it's just your wall, we'll understand. You don't have to apologize. That won't happen. That won't happen. That okay. won't happen. But so, I, I will say, yep. 2023, it was the year of the woman. I mean, <laughs> Come on, you 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 had Barbie, which was a cultural phenomena, the biggest film at the box office, both domestically and internationally. So we, it's safe to say it was a global phenomena. I mean, you had the Taylor Swift movie, you had the Beyonce movie. I mean, those three movies alone saved the box office in 2023. Mm -hmm. It was yeah. also a really sneaky good year for Black film. You had movies like Rustin, American Fiction, They Clone Tyrone, Spider-Man, Across the Spider-Verse. You had Ava DuVernay's Origin. You had The Color Purple. I mean, there were so many phenomenal movies. I even loved Jamie Foxx and The Burial. So it was a yeah. it was a sneaky good year for Black film, but it was a phenomenal year for women. Here's the thing, uh, Sean. Is it enough that Black cinema is speaking and attracting black audiences do they have to expand that audience they have to keep going and and widen their scope and their footprint well they have i mean you, you look at a film like american fiction i mean across the board it was critically loved you look right. at a movie like the color purple across the board it was love i mean ava right. duvernay's origin across the board it was love rustin an amazing movie about the civil rights movement across the board was love. I mean, Spider-Man across the Spider-Verse, box office hit across. The, I mean, these movies all are universal. And so that's why it's a, a, a sneaky good year because they appeal to, to every demographic. The same way that, you know, Barbie and the Taylor Swift movie and the Beyonce movie, it just wasn't women going to see those movies. Those movies attracted men as well. I mean, they had a universality to them. That's why they were so successful. They couldn't be that successful if only women went to go see those movies. Which is why I asked the question, Terry Hart. Yeah, I would say just to add to that, you know, American Fiction won the People's Choice Award at this year's, or at 2023's yeah. Toronto International Film Festival, which is often a bellwether for what goes on, what goes the distance, as we say in the business, um, through the award season. And we're seeing that with American Fiction. And, you know, Origins, Ava DuVernay's Origins, also premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival, and we saw great success for that film there. So I completely agree with Sean that that is what we're seeing, is that what would have been originally kind of marketed and pigeonholed to like one demographic 
is having that global appeal and attracting audiences from outside of its core demographic yeah. and bleeding over. And that yeah. is to speak to the quality of the movies, right? Yeah. That's to speak to the quality of what Cord Jefferson did in American fiction, to what Greta Gerwig and Margot Robbie did in Barbie. And I mean, I think that that is, uh, that's really, and you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention also Celine Song's Past Lives, which has been this sneaky little tiny movie that yeah. came out of Sundance that all of a sudden is on the tip of everybody's tongue of, have you seen it? Have you had that emotional experience? Because what she and Greta Lee do in that movie, she being the writer and director, Celine, and Greta starring in it is, I mean, the seminal emotional experience for me this year at the movies. We're talking films here for the next 30 minutes. If you ever wanted to know about the films that you have heard about, and, and have not seen or are intrigued by, just know that the Critics' Choice Awards are happening Sunday, and Hillary is going to take us through the nuts and bolts of how that happens. It's on the CW. She's got all those details. Because Hillary Atkin in Los Angeles is the chair of the marketing uh, division of Critics' Choice. LA-based, writes for LA Magazine, Deadline Hollywood, and many others. Terry Hart is in Toronto, film critic Terry Hart. Bonnie Lawfer. Uh, uh, almost from the land of three named people, Sirius uh, XM Radio and uh, the um, uh, CH Morning Live. She is a, a film critic, of course. And Sean Edwards in Kansas City's WDAF-TV Fox, also on the board of directors of the Critics' Choice. Whew. I knew this was going to be fun. Okay, uh, Hil <laughs> Hillary, um, before we start, I'm going to start with Best Picture in just a second, but just remind us about Sunday and how this is going to roll out on the CW. Yes, 7 p.m. Sunday, the 14th of January. Chelsea Handler is our host for the second year in a row. Last year, she killed it. I guarantee you there's going to be no Joe Coy criticism Monday morning quarterbacking of her. There may be a few, maybe not tasteful jokes in there, but she's going to do an amazing job holding down our three-hour show. Um, we have Harrison Ford as our Lifetime Achievement honoree. He's being presented by James Mangold, who directed him in his last outing as Indiana Jones. That should be amazing. And then another incredible pairing we have that just announced today is that Margot Robbie will be presenting America Ferreira with the See Her Award, which recognizes excellence in um, female on-screen performances. So. Aside from everything else we have, I just think it's going to be an amazing show. Again, it's at 7 p.m. Eastern on the CW, but check local listings in your region to find out when you can see it live Sunday. I'm excited. And for the Canadian audience, just know that... Um that I, don't, I think and Bonnie and uh, Terry and I uh, agree we, we go to KTLA on, on our package, right? Or how do you we want do. it? We do. We also, well, in Southern Ontario, you can get it on CH, CH TV, uh, the station that I, I Wonderful. Wonderful. About on. I love the way um, it pops up. No, I don't know about the rest of Canada, but yes, if you have uh, a good package, a cable package, you can get it on KTLA and also the CW. Wonderful. So Sean Edwards, I'm starting with you, buddy. Best picture. American picture, Fiction, the Critics' Barbie. Choice Awards this year will probably be Barbie. I mean, and it it, it 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 should be. I mean, but there's some stiff competition. I mean, you have Oppenheimer, and uh, I'm not writing off the the two little engines they could, the holdovers in American Fiction, and then I mean, you never know. There may be some 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 last minute votes come in for Killers of the Flower Moon. I hope not, but you never know. <laughs> Okay, Hillary. Moon record. I, I I hated that movie. So Hillary, Moon record. Hillary, what, same, what do you think? Same, Sean. Same, same. <laughs> I hated that movie. I don't. I I don't understand why, how people think that's it's a positive film for for Native American. I I don't get it. But yeah. you know, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm Hillary sorry. Atkin. Best picture. Okay. Um. You know, I'm going to respectfully disagree with Sean. I I'm kind of feeling like best picture is Oppenheimer's to lose. I feel like there's you know, so many tailwinds at, a, at its back. Um, but it, I think it is going to come down to, again, the Barbenheimer phenomenon, and it is going to be against those two. Mm -hmm. I would love to see one of the smaller pictures that we've been talking about win, but I don't think that's going to happen. Um, regardless of what's going to happen, it's going to be great. I know it. Terry Hart? Yeah, I'm saying Barbie. 
Uh, I'm saying Barbie and not with any tongue in cheek. I'm saying Barbie uh, with my full chest because this <laughs> is, as I said at the beginning of this chat, this is a movie that is a global phenomenon. This changed the game. This is going to change the kind of movies that get made in the future. This is gonna change who gets to make movies in the future. This is not just a great movie. This is a movie that changed the business. And I feel like there's something terrible that is happening and I worry that the great global success and financial success of Barbie is biting it in its butt. And that is what concerns me mm. that Oppenheimer could come through because I believe Barbie deserves it more than Oppenheimer. And I will say my favorite movie of the year was Past Lives, very closely followed by Barbie. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bonnie. Well, look, I agree with everybody. I, I think Barbie might take it or Oppenheimer. There's just no question about, you know, the trajectory of that. But I would love to see the holdovers. I love that movie beyond belief. It made me feel good. It was so great to have that director and Paul Giamatti back together again. Um, I mean, really way too long since Sideways. Uh, we needed that reunion a lot sooner. Um, Divine Joy Randolph is just, um, Ru Rudolph, it's, it's Randolph, right? Yep, Randolph, Randolph. Yeah, Randolph. Yeah, sorry, Randolph, yeah, sorry. Um, just phenomenal. Uh, newcomer, the kids and that, I mean, thing was just so great about that film. I would love to see it sneak up. And and I just love Paul Giamatti and the fact that he took his Golden Globe to In and Out Burger just made me love him more. <laughs> I will say, I will say I love when a filmmaker comes back and makes me love them again. And I was so mad at Alexander Payne after downsizing. And so yeah. Yeah. To fall back in love yeah. with him as yeah, a yeah, filmmaker yeah. and see him do something that I also love, Bonnie. Dominic Sessa is an absolute discovery. And the tone of that movie, right? I think that that's another thing we saw is yeah. a lot of these movies are balancing interesting, different tones. We're talking films here for the next 30 minutes. Just know that the Critics' Choice Awards are happening Sunday. And Hillary is going to take us through the nuts and bolts of how that happens. It's on the CW. She's got all those details. Because Hillary Atkin in Los Angeles is the chair of the marketing uh, division of Critics' Choice. LA-based, writes for LA Magazine, Deadline Hollywood, and many others. Terry Hart is in Toronto, film critic Terry Hart. Hi, Terry Hart. Bonnie Laufer, Sirius uh, XM Radio, and uh, the um, uh, CH Morning Live. She is a, a film critic, of course. And Sean Edwards in Kansas City's WDAF TV Fox, also on the board of directors of the Critics Choice. I got to move real along. Real quick, Chris. I do want to. I do want to interject real quick. I don't believe that Barbie's been penalized because of his box office success. I actually think that helps. I actually think Barbie's been penalized because people of lesser intellect believe that that movie is just about a plastic doll uh. but it it's a cultural phenomena that had a lot to say Ooh. and that's a really Ooh. hard thing to achieve and accomplish so i really wish people wouldn't think that way but i think there are some people that think that it's just a movie about a toy hey sean it yeah. is up for original screenplay you know yeah, i know that but i it just there's this in my gut i just feel that people are they will giving it the respect that it deserves. Because There's a dismissiveness there for sure, Sean. Yes. Thank you, friends. Mm -hmm. We're going to move along now, starting with Hillary. Best actor. Uh, let me get them uh, out. Brad, okay, oh, Bradley is... Cooper, Leonardo DiCaprio, Coleman Domingo, Paul Giamatti, Jillian uh, Murphy, and uh, Jeffrey Wright. It's an incredibly strong category. The only other person I would have loved to have seen included, I don't know if any of you guys agree with me, is Nicolas Cage in Dream Scenario. <laughs> um, otherwise, I love the category. My personal favorite, uh, Paul Giamatti, absolutely. <laughs> and then secondarily, Jeffrey Wright in exactly. American Fiction, I yeah. thought was just spot on perfect. I loved his performance. I saw both those movies twice, actually American Fiction three times. They all held up. Um, they both held up. And uh, anyway, I do think Killian Murphy has a very strong chance of taking it. So I'd love to hear everyone else's thoughts. Bonnie Laffer. 
Okay, I agree. I think Killian's got it, but I really want to see Coleman Domingo. I, I just want him to win. He is extraordinary. What, three films, major huge films this year. Wait till you see him in Sing. I saw that at the Toronto International Film Festival. Blew my mind. If you think what you've seen him do this year already, just wait till you see Sing. I want Coleman Domingo so badly to win for Rustin, but I have a feeling, um, and, and Jeffrey Wright also, I agree with you, Hillary. I think he really totally deserves it as well. He needs his due. It's his time as well. But I just have this feel, feeling we're going to see Killian Murphy for Oppenheimer. Sean Edwards. Well, the Leonardo DiCaprio nomination did not age well, so he's not winning. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. <laughs> it, it did not age well at all. Yeah. It, it because we you know we consider ourselves like the Oscar prognosticators, but it, it did not it, it it did not age well. I would love to see Jeffrey Wright, but it's probably Killian. But I would love to see Jeffrey Wright. Wonderful. And Terry, uh, I'm saying Coleman. Um, I don't think he will win. I think it is going to be Killian. But in terms of you know, I really like to try when we're talking about the acting categories is really break out those performances from the movie. And Rustin was a good movie. It wasn't a great movie, but my goodness gracious, Coleman Domingo's performance as Rustin, as Bayard, Bayard Rustin was phenomenal. And to do that kind of performance in a movie that is good, not great, is even more exceptional in my opinion. Okay, I'm gonna do best actress now. We gotta go, because we're, we're not even halfway through yet. Uh, uh, Hillary, uh, you have done so many Zoom meetings this year. You know how this works. Sometimes the screen is filled with 20, 30 people. Everybody has an opinion. Yes, this, this I'm going to keep mine tight, Terry. The first thing I want to say about the best actress category, um, there's still controversy about Lily Gladstone on whether she's lead or supporting. I personally think she was a supporting actress. Her screen time was about maybe mm, oh, half the film. Most of that half, she was in bed. So much as I was thrilled to see a Native American actor win at the Golden Globes and her speech was amazing, um, you know, I just, I can't get behind it because I think it was a supporting performance. It's just positioned as a lead. So I'll tell you, but I, I feel like she has a very good chance because of all these other circumstances surrounding that nomination. I'll tell you who I'd really like to see going back to Maestro. I thought Carrie Mulligan was absolutely brilliant in Maestro. Um, you know, I, Emma Stone has tailwinds at her back as well. Um, and I'm feeling like Critics' Choice may, if it's not Lily, may go with Margot for Barbie because she was the absolute <laughs> most perfect Barbie you could ever visualize on screen. Excuse me, Sean Edwards, you, you shook your head there for a moment. I saw that. Lily Glassstone, her name's already on the trophy. Thank you so much. Terry Hart. Nobody, nobody's skipping over, no no, <laughs> no organization skipping over that history. Okay, yeah. Terry Hart. Agreed, agreed. Okay. It will be, it should be Lily Gladstone. Uh, I mentioned also to Emma Stone what she did in Poor Things, which is not one of my favorite movies of the year. Um, but what she did with that performance was remarkable, but it will be Lily Gladstone. Well said, Bonnie Laffer. Big ditto, like word for word for what Terry just said. That was just gonna crap right out of my mouth. But yeah, I, I, I'm rooting for Lily Gladstone. I think she's a brilliant actress and uh, I hope she gets it. But yeah, Emma did give us such a great performance in Poor Things. Okay. Plus Lily went up, she went up, like she went up to actress. It's not like she was, um, uh, best actress lead who went down to supporting to win because it's easier. She went up where it's harder. Right, right. This for from, sure. This from all a, the acting categories are tight, 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 tight. This year. <laughs> this this from a man, Sean Edwards, who says he is a movie critic and he loves wine and he does the both t together would be good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, all right. Best supporting actor and actress, starting with uh, Hillary. Okay, I'm going to start. With supporting actor, again, this is a really incredible category. And one performance I want to call out, I don't think he's going to win. I absolutely love Sterling K. Brown in American fiction. We've never seen him play this kind of character before. I was just blown away by it. Uh, my personal favorite is Ryan Gosling in Barbie. I I loved Ryan. He was 
the absolute perfect can. Brave. And it was brave. The cans made the movie. Without the cans, there would be no Barbie. I feel like, God, any one of these other men could take this category. I'm I'm feeling like Critics' Choice is going to go with Brian and add to the wins that Barbie's going to get. And Jerry, if you want me to continue on to supporting yep. actress, um, every single one of these performances grab me america ferreras and barbie her monologue it's one for the film history books however we are also giving her the see her award and i think that this category will become a race between danielle brooks and yep. davine randolph both of whom were absolutely mm -hmm. incredible in their roles again just thinking about their roles taking them out of the the film they were in those two are my favorites, and I'm having a hard time deciding. Bonnie. Uh, yeah, I, I'm going to go with the supporting actor. Uh, I would like to see Charles Melton for May, December. I really hated that movie with passion, but I really thought that he did a very subtle, just my heart broke watching his performance in that. That was not an easy performance. I don't think he's going to win. I don't know. I think. Robert Downey Jr. might grab it for Oppenheimer. Um, he can never do any wrong, as far as I'm concerned. The guy's a brilliant actor, so I'll just I'll just slam it down there. Okay. Uh, for Best Supporting Actress, I really, really do hope that Danielle Brooks gets it. I think she was absolutely spectacular in The Color Purple. Um, I loved The Color Purple. I've now watched it three times. I could probably recite it line for line. I just think it's amazing, and I really want to see Danielle Brooks. But I think uh, Divine is going to get it for the holdovers, which I wouldn't be upset about either. I think she was spectacular. Hey, Terry, what up? What up? Uh, supporting actor, Ryan Gosling. Supporting actress, Divine Joy Randolph. Um, I think that these are, um, the ship hasn't left the building or it's in the middle of the, the ocean. <laughs> yeah, for, for both of these categories. Um, <laughs> you know, I think that, one of the things coming out of Barbie that a lot of people said were they feel felt terrible coming out of Barbie and talking about Ryan Gosling and talking about the Kens. Um, and, you know, I think that what he did there was a revelation. People associate him with being quite a serious guy. And he was obviously having some fun and uh, also had a big emotional part to play in terms of Barbie's trajectory. Divine Joy Randolph, again, is the emotional backbone, I think, of what we see in the holdovers. It allows those kind of broad performances by Paul Giamatti and Dominic Sessa kind of level them out a bit by her okay. kind of um, stalwartness and her emotion and her actual truth throughout the movie, which is heartbreaking. So those are my two picks. Okay, Sean? All right, you gotta, these things only work if you can create some viral moments. Um, <clears throat> Critics' Choice Association, I, I was sort of leaning toward Ryan Gosling, but I think it's gonna be Robert Downey Jr. And I want Robert Downey Jr. to win an Oscar because I want him to have that Oscar in his hand and be the last person to play a character in blackface who got no kickback. <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be a lot of nice, fun. Nice, <laughs> nice, nice. a lot of fun. And, um, okay, okay. Ryan, Divine Joy Randolph's going to win because her role, her character is cinematic comfort food. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm going to stick with you. And, and we have to leave a couple of minutes because Hillary's going to wrap up with all of the information that everybody needs. Okay. Including what, what category are we doing now? Sean, Sean, I'm going to stick with you with Director. Oh, that's mm. so easy. Are you serious? Christopher Nolan Oppenheimer is not even close. I agree. For once, I agree. I want it to be Greta, but it, I'm saying, I know how I'm, these boats, it just, it ain't happening. Okay, so, sorry, I know you didn't call me, Terry, but I'm jumping in here because that's what I do. I know I'm Canadian and I'm supposed to be polite, but <laughs> we are talking Oscar, or we are talking Critics' Choice here. Um, I am answering these questions based on who I believe should win. And I believe what yeah. Greta Gerwig did in terms of the tone and how many things... She directed a comedy, a drama, a musical, a socially relevant movie. She, it's all in there. Yes, Christopher Nolan made this opus. And yes, there are 16 courtroom scenes in Oppenheimer. But <laughs> I'm not, maybe 17. But what <laughs> Greta did in terms of managing all of that is actually the best directed movie of the year, period, full stop. I'll give, I'll give you a message because uh, she had to work with every shot, she had to talk it through. They had to live it. They had, that was a lot of work. 
But yeah. she's also the winner of best director should also be the person who directed a film that no one else could direct, and that is Greta Gerwig. But she's not winning. Bonnie. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of with Sean on that. I, I agree with everything Carrie just said. I think Greta did a tremendous job on Barbie, and it was a movie I was not looking forward to. Um, and I was, you know, happily surprised when I saw it. But I just, I really do think that Christopher Nolan is going to walk away with Best Director. I think it's his time. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll stick with that. What do you think, Hillary? I would love to see Greta win. I mean, she's the first female director who's who's helmed a billion dollar plus picture. And as people have said here, she had, you know, so many plates spinning. She had to direct a musical, a drama, a comedy. I love her. I But I also think Christopher Nolan is gonna take the directing prize. I just wanna say one more thing about our category. We have six nominees. Um, five of them have been nominated for Directors Guild Awards. And the other one is Bradley Cooper for Maestro. So uh, I don't think he has a shot. Thank you. <laughs> now, I, I, again, I have to leave a couple of minutes for Hillary. So here's the deal. I'm just going to throw this out. Original screenplay, which is important to me. I, I, it's one of the categories that I always look for. Um, who wants to call it, Bonnie? Original screenplay. Um, I'm saying Barbie. Yeah, I have a feeling. Yes, I agree. I, 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 I'm going to go with Barbie on that Anybody one. for holdovers? Because- the holdovers was amazing. I, it's a very tight one between the two, play. but That's I just great. have a feeling that Barbie might slip in. Not on critics' this. choice. Not critics' choice. It's the Barbie. Lives, it's no. Barbie for original and American fiction adapted. Okay. Okay. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Hillary, it comes to you, the closer. <laughs> well, can I what? say one thing before she closes? Oh, sure you can. Absolutely. I just, I just, I just want to say, shame on the Critics' Choice Association for not showing very much love for Ava DuVernay's origin. Yeah. What's up with yeah. that? I don't know. I just had to get yeah. that out. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Anjanine okay, was Nicholas phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to throw that in. What's up? What's yours, Hillary? I said and for no love for Nicolas Cage. Oh, mm-hmm. uh, okay. But that's the nature right. of the game. Tell us about the, uh, the uh, Critics' Choice Awards <laughs> Sunday night. Okay, Sunday night, January 14th, Chelsea Handler is hosting our approximately three hour show where we award the absolute best in film and television. Chelsea is gonna be an amazing host. She did it last year. She knows the rope, she knows the drill. Um, I don't know if it matters to the TV audience. It's gonna be on the CW, but we're at a different venue that is kind of um, ripe for comedic jokes. It's, it's an airplane hangar, you guys, in Santa Monica, California. Uh, we've been there before, not yep. for a couple of years. We have some amazing honorees, Harrison Ford getting the Lifetime Achievement Award and America Ferreira getting the See Her Award. And I just think it's gonna be a fantastic show. Um, I wanna uh, urge everyone to watch it live and uh, check your lo- local listings for the CW. It's at 7 p.m. Eastern. And Canadians, please tell us where we can watch yes, it in please. Canada. Terry. Bond. Oh, uh, if you are in Southern Ontario, CHCH out of Hamilton, and uh, depending on your cable package, KTLA, or what's the other one, Bond? Also CW, but it's also under PICS, P-I-X. Right. So a few options in Canada as well. Does that mean that, uh, Sean, that, that uh, people would have to make a choice in Kansas City whether to watch the the, the, the football game or the Awards? No, our football game's on Saturday. We oh, did. that's right, too. Okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> our football game's Saturday, so Sunday's wide open. <laughs> watch. Please watch. Look at this. Look at it's, this. It's the, year, it's, the year, it's the year of the woman, so hopefully there's a lot of love in the room. In under yeah. the wire. Woo! There's going to be a lot of pink in the room. That I guarantee you. Yes. A lot of pink. On the, yes. <laughs> Hillary, do you and know Chelsea what will have fun with the Barbie theme. Yeah. Good luck with the red carpet. It'll be fun. Uh, it's always fun. It's always going. fun. It's always we'll a at, fun show. We'll be at home yeah. op- and open to my wine. I'm, I'm good with you guys. Thank you so much for doing this. I knew no, it was going to be fun. I Thanks, Harry. Thanks for getting fun. it together. 